Towards the last half of the second hour of this episode, our guest brings up a topic involving the Holocaust. I just want to make perfectly clear that I do not support this theory. The guest himself wants to make it clear that he sees all people as equally valuable. That said, there are dangers in what is said. So myself, Paranormal Now, KGRA Radio, we do not condone or represent this theory. I'll have more to say about this in the next episode of Paranormal Now. So if you want to tune into that live show, um, you'll hear why it's offensive and why it's important. We have to be very careful with our words, as well as where my responsibility lies as a host to challenge and question where needed and when to move on. And whatever you are, welcome, good souls of the planet and beyond to Paranormal Now. I'm Alan B. Smith. Join us as we traverse the cosmic highway of paranormal portals and tantalizing turnoffs. Tonight, it's contact with non-human intelligences and an independent researcher's case for a cover-up of extraterrestrial evidence laid out for us right here on this Earth. We have two guests for you tonight. The first of which is Rainero Hernandez, and he'll be coming up in just a moment. Please share, as always, your thoughts and experiences with us during or after the show on Facebook.com slash Paranormal Now Radio or on Twitter at Paranormal underscore now. And please do join us in the KGRA chat room where you can pose your questions and join the conversation. If you could take a moment to check out my Paranormal Pop YouTube channel page and subscribe. I'd really appreciate that. Just go to youtube.com slash paranormal pop. The, uh, the next video in the fun with ufology series will cover the O'Hare international airport UFO sighting. So I'm obviously, uh, I'm, I'm going down my checklist of some of my favorite UFO events and it's not necessarily the most fantastical UFO events that are the most intriguing. So stay tuned for that. And then the second hour, Ryushin Malone is going to be joining me. And uh, he will be connecting the dots using his own independent research, the Orion connection, the Nazca lines, evidence for ETs being covered up, underground railroads, so much more. And I'd also like to thank the, the Paracast Network's extraterrestrial podcast for the shout out in their december 17th 2019 episode number 45 citing my conversation here with summers on paranormal now so i really appreciate that thanks so much to bill thomas and tim johnson in the last half hour tonight we'll open up the paranormal radio app hotline so wait for your cue to call in and just dial the paranormal radio app hotline that's 855-472-5483 or 85-KGRA-LIVE to ask your questions. That's 85-KGRA-LIVE. And I hope we'll get to hear your thoughts, your respectful critiques, and new ideas, hopefully, to consider. My returning guest in the first hour tonight, Ray Hernandez, is one of the four co-founders of the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation. He graduated with honors from Rutgers College, was a master's candidate at Cornell University and was a PhD candidate at UC Berkeley, where he was the recipient of a National Science Foundation PhD fellowship. He previously was an adjunct professor for six years at the New School for Social Research and at the City University of New York. Ray has published several peer-reviewed academic articles on consciousness and the free experience of research study, was a co-editor of an 820-page heavy book titled Beyond UFOs, The Science of Consciousness and Contact with Non-Human Intelligence, and will be the co-editor of a two-volume series titled Beyond Materialism, 
Ray is also the co-producer of a science-based documentary with the same title. Ray has lectured all over the world and in the U.S. on the relationship between consciousness and contact with non-human intelligence via the contact, quote, contact modalities. Ray is currently, currently an attorney and resides in Miami, Florida with his family. His organizational website is consciousnessandcontact.org. Ray, welcome back to Paranormal Now. Thank you very much for the invitation. Absolutely. So what's new? Uh, what's new is that um, uh, myself and uh, 20 other PhD academics and five medical doctors have formed an organization titled Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, CCRI. And um, most of the academics from the Free Foundation uh, also joined us. And what we're focusing on, unlike the previous research study that focused only on individuals that have seen UFOs and have had contact with non-human intelligence, this new uh, academic research will focus on the major contact experiencers of the contact modalities. And let me give a brief definition of the contact modalities. Yes. Uh, these are all the different ways that humans are piercing the veil of our 3D reality and having... Uh, contact with non-human intelligence. For example, near-death experiences, mm -hmm. uh, UFOs, out-of-body experiences, people that, is, that see ghosts or spirits, uh, remote viewing, channeling, um, mystical meditation, hallucinogenic journeys, etc., etc., etc. So these are all different ways that humans uh, are having contact with non-human intelligence. And what they have in common, all of them, is that all of them involve a manipulation of space-time. And um, mo all of the individuals in our organization, and I could go over all the heavyweights that we have in the group, uh, all of us hypothesize, number one, that consciousness is primary. And for, you know, for a layman's jargon, uh, that is that um, our reality is not what we perceive it to be, that uh, just like the uh, ancient uh, Indian tradition, it's Maya, it's an illusion, um, uh, and uh, actually George Knapp actually believes the same thing for those that, um, that listen to Coast to Coast all the time. And secondly, all of us hypothesize that all of what I'm calling the contact modalities, that they're all interrelated and they need to be study, studied as one phenomenon instead of separate and distinct phenomenon. And so we're going to be embarking on a five-year academic research study, uh, first to identify the major experiencers of the contact modalities. These are individuals that have had NDEs, have had out-of-body experiences, have had uh, seen UFOs, uh, diverse contact with non-human intelligence, um, have had a whole array of paranormal experiences. And then we want to basically uh, bombard them with tons of questionnaires, both quantitative and qualitative questionnaires, and also um, with uh, uh, structured interviews, which will be uh, recorded and transcribed, um, and will be uh, and the questions that we'll be asking, we'll be asking uh, various hypotheses to test out. Um, and I could go into a little bit of that later on. So well, let this me ask is a, you real yes. quick: Are you familiar with Don Miguel Ruiz? He's the author of the Four Agreements. No, I don't know who he is. Okay. When you use the words veil and colorful words like fog that really help paint that sort of a picture, what what is that? What what is the veil like what is going on inside our brains or, or is it an outside thing that's affecting us? Well, that's what we're trying to understand. Um, half of those people, uh, these PhD academics uh, involved in our organization, uh, they've been studying what is commonly called consciousness, uh, many of them for close to 50 years. Uh, we've got uh, Dean Radin. We've got um, Dr. Rudy Shields from Harvard. We've got uh, Claude Swanson from Princeton. Uh, we've got uh, Jeffrey Mishloff uh, from Berkeley. Um, uh, we've got uh, Gary Schwartz, who was a tenured professor at Yale of, of, of psychology, and I could go on and on and on with all these names. But the, the main purpose of this all is that when you ask each and every one of them, what is consciousness, each and every one would, would respond, 
I have the faintest, faintest idea, <laughs> okay? We really don't know what is the true nature of reality. What, we, what they, all of them speculate is that our reality is not what it is, that it's actually a multidimensional reality. And um, uh, if you uh, were to ask uh, theoretical physicists all around the world, uh, most of them are adherents to a multiverse theory. That means that we don't live in one reality, that we, uh, we, uh, depending on the theory that, that, uh, that they are an adherent to, for example, uh, string theory that Michio Kago is very famous, especially in, uh, even in the people that follow ufology, uh, string theory holds that there are 11 to 12 dimensions, but even within string theory, uh, he mentioned the other day that there's the possibility of almost an infinite amount of dimensions. So, um, and then there's the many worlds theory, uh, uh, um, started by uh, Hugh Everett, that theory, uh, way back in the 50s. So, um, the, there are literally a whole array of, uh, of, of, uh, of, of physics concepts that talk about a multiverse. And then the latest concept is uh, the simulation uh, theory. Uh, we have a Nobel Prize winner in physics that's uh, an adherent of that. And at, um, at numerous universities, including MIT, there's three tenured theoretical physicists that are uh, discussing uh, simulated reality hypotheses. So what we're trying to do is to begin to be able to test many of these multidimensional hypotheses through the major experiencers of the contact modalities. And I could give you some examples later on. Well, can you give us an example now to help help take us on this journey with you? <clears throat> okay, all right. Um, in our survey, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Experiencer Research Study, mm -hmm. which um, very few people have actually even bothered to read the free materials that I send out. Um, uh, again, I, I make an option open to all the listeners here. Um, I will send you chapter one of our 820-page uh, book. Chapter one has 120 pages. Mm -hmm. And that really is a, it's a summary of, uh, of much of our data from our research study. Yeah, and I will... Well, Ray, I will say this. Um, what I found, because before you actually published the book, I guess it must have been like two and a half, three years ago, you had sent me materials leading up to the book. And honestly, some of it was at such a PhD level that it was a little, it was a little rough reading through. Um, and and that's, that's not a critique at all. On, on the work that you do, it's a compliment. Um, so I think I can understand sometimes where where hosts might get a little like, oh, this is really heady stuff. Well, what what I do is uh, if people send me an email to info i n f o at experiencer dot org info at experiencer dot org, mm -hmm. I will send them chapter one, which is. Uh, toned down a lot. It's not an academic piece. Uh, we do have academic articles that we've published on our research study. Uh, it was published in the Journal of Consciousness uh, and also in the Journal of Scientific uh, Exploration. Uh, that was, you know, a little bit more difficult to read. But chapter one, we and the entire book, we wrote it for the normal layperson. So we'll, we'll give you that to read for free and numerous other chapters. And we'll also send out a six-page summary abstract in case you don't want to read the 120 pages. There's six pages to read of our major findings. That's fantastic. And, okay. And one of the items that we discovered, again, relating to this topic that we're talking about, is that um, um, uh, numerous of our findings contradict what is circulating in mainstream ufology. Uh, most of these um, uh, so-called experts in ufology that are on this lecture circuit, uh, they have no idea what is really going on with experiencers. And the reason for that is that that's not their focus. They're focused on, you know, pictures, videos, the new Tic Tac uh, gossip that's coming out from the Pentagon, when will disclosure come, things of that sort. Um, our focus is to do academic research of the individuals that have had encounters with UFO-related uh, uh, um, entities uh, mm. and that have seen UFOs. So one of the major topics, uh, the major um, uh, findings, is that while individuals are having physical experiences, they might have seen a physical being, they might have seen a physical UFO, the overwhelming percentage of their experiences are paranormal in nature. Like in, in my case, I've seen three up-close UFOs. Okay, uh, Each time 
with uh, with other people. The first time was with my daughter and three friends. Um, about two years ago, I was up um, at uh, the ranch of um, of an attorney who's a Princeton graduate, and he has a monthly CE5 session. Um, at 12 o'clock, everybody went inside or left because it was freezing cold, uh, but I went outside again with, uh, with Mike. His name is Mike Marburg. He was still there and two other individuals, and within 15 minutes, a big, gigantic UFO uh, flew right up, above us uh, with no wings, looked like a big, gigantic blimp and um, uh, made a sharp turn, you know, about 100 feet, 150 feet on top of us. So, but yet, uh, I can only count on my hand three times that I've seen a, a up-close UFO. And then a physical being, only one time in my living room, I saw an energy being. But I had two years of nonstop paranormal experiences. Well, what we found out in our research study of over 4,200 individuals from more than 100 countries, the same thing. These people were leading paranormal lives. They uh, might have seen UFOs, they might have seen physical beings, but the overwhelming percentages of our experiences were paranormal. Let me give you a couple examples, okay? Um, 80% of these individuals were having out-of-body experiences. Mm -hmm. 95% had had, uh, are having paranormal experiences in their home. Okay, uh, orbs. Sixty percent have seen orbs, not via pictures, but you know, a real f f orb. You know, very close, uh, uh, close to them. Um, in terms of ghosts and spirits, uh, over sixty percent of the people have seen uh, a ghost and spirit, and the vast majority of them have actually communicated with this entity. Um, Fifty percent were taken to um, um, a matrix reality, which is uh, if you've seen the the movie of Jodie Foster, Contact, oh, yeah. uh, similar to that, they were brought to a non three D reality and interacting with a non human intelligence. That's fifty percent of the people. Fifty percent of the people, either themselves or a member of their family, had a miraculous medical healing. Okay, we're talking about you know more than a thousand people, um, um, and um, in terms of other, uh, thirty-seven percent have had a near-death experience. Um, I could go on and on and on, check all the the list of of pa the paranormal, and these people you know fit that bill. So. Um, Again, mainstream materialist ufology is totally clueless about that. The experiencers know about it. When you go to a UFO conference and you talk to experiencers, you know, they're like, duh, well, of course, you know. Why? Because they're experiencing these things. And they go to these conferences to talk to other experiencers and try to get some answers. Well, but I, uh, I can understand the skeptic's point of view. I mean, we all know that there are a number of things that have happened or behaviors by humans that have been explained by science. So I think the skeptic's point of view is, well, we just haven't explained this yet either. Okay, let me give you an example. Um, we, as I said before, we had 50% of the people that took our survey that stated that they've had a miraculous medical healing, okay? Um, this was documented over 25 years ago by Preston Dennett. He wrote a book titled UFO Healings, which nobody read. Nobody paid attention. They were off buying hot off the press all the hybridization books that, um, that uh, David Jacobs was writing. And again, uh, he got his information via hypnotic regression, and he only worked with 200 people. That's it. So I don't consider that academic research at all, okay? So what we did is uh, because I, my first initial experience involved the medical healing of our dog, who we were going to be euthanizing later that afternoon. Uh, the day before, that night before, my wife was praying all night because uh, we found out that a dog became totally paralyzed. So she was praying all night, and in the morning, this energy being appeared in our living room, made my wife and dog disappear, put me to sleep. And then when I woke up, our 15-year-old dog, who for two years couldn't even run or jump, was now running around the living room um, like a teenager. OK, uh, so we asked that question and what uh, we have a chapter in our book, which I will give to free to anybody Just send me an email at info at experiencer dot org. And I'll send you chapter six for free. Chapter six was written by um, Dr. Joseph Burks. Dr. Joseph Burks is a retired emergency room physician. This is not a quack. This is uh, a man who worked as an ER doctor in Southern California for over 35 years. Yeah, Dr. Was, Burks has been on the show a number of times. 
Correct. So he's not a quack. And then the other person is Preston Dennett, who has written a ton of books on the topic of ufology. And so they jointly wrote that book. And what they did is they took um, uh, 12 case studies. They asked for medical records of these case studies. Um, and, um, and, and Dr. Burks reviewed the medical records. And the first uh, person that we put in our book was another medical doctor, another emergency room physician, uh, who basically had a, had a, um, uh, went into shock because of the loss of blood. He had his uh, wisdom teeth extracted, and they were just gushing. Uh, he went home, and he couldn't control the bleeding, and all the blood was just gushing out. And then um, he's, he was trying to, to uh, push it down, you know, to try to stop the bleeding. And then he eventually, uh, he passed out because he was in shock. Uh, he had looked in the mirror, he was all white, and he knew it was bad news, and, um, and, and then the next thing he knew, he woke up, he was on a, a gurney, uh, there was these three little small greys around him, and um, he saw them, there was a big white light on him, and uh, he experienced that for a couple of minutes, and uh, he was paralyzed, he couldn't move, and then the next thing, he woke up, he was on his bed, there was blood all over from his bed and all these gauzes, but he had no pain. His huge swelling were all gone, and his gums were all healed, like a normal person. Okay, so basically, what you're saying, because I'm, I'm just going to cut you off here because we're going yep. to a break, is is that this is really something that cannot just be explained by some, you know, by a skeptic. By by a skeptic, I, I get it. Okay, so we'll we'll continue yep. this conversation when we get back on the other side of this break. This is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now on KGRA Radio. Stand by. We'll be right back. Podcast on iTunes, iHeart, and Spotify. KGRARadio.com. This is Paranormal Now. Welcome back to Paranormal Now. My guest is Renero Hernandez, and he is the co-founder of Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation. Taking us out of the break was Septembrio. If you want to find out more about their music, go to Septembrio with a Y dot com. So Ray, we were we had left it off at this man waking up on a gurney, uh, surrounded by gray aliens of the white light, then on his bed uh, with bloody bandages, I think you said. Well, he's a medical doctor. Okay, yeah. and so yeah. then, and then, what what happened uh, next? He was completely healed, and then he sent us his uh, medical records of having that that done, and then he immediately um, uh, 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 had another medical doctor that he knew to come by to verify what had happened to him, and. Um, and also, we had an individual that was healed from a stage four cancer uh, by an orb that went into his abdomen, which he captured on the film because he was seeing tons of orbs. And he had one of those night cameras, uh, which captured an orb, go into his stomach. And then all of a sudden, he felt like great. Um, he went to the doctor uh, whenever his appointment because he was going through... Um, uh, a, a diagnosis of his cancer, which has mis metastasized throughout his body. And then um, uh, after that orb had gone into his body, uh, he had zero cancer in his body. Mm -hmm. And we got those medical records as well. And it was just, uh, you know, one medical record after another after another. And so, uh, and again, I'll give out to the audience members chapter six of our book, uh, but again, that's just one little tiny finding of hundreds of other findings from that research study. And uh, I also want to make a clarification. Um, the Dr. Edgar Mitchell Free Foundation no longer exists, okay? I am now the, the director of the Consciousness and Contact Research Institute. Um, uh, our focus, again, is, is of this new organization is not on experiencers of the UFOs, but now on experiencers of all of the paranormal so, uh, contact so, modalities. So just to clarify, right, these are not simultaneously existent. They're 
free is no longer Correct, because Free's objective was to be able to do the world's first comprehensive academic research study of UFO contact experiencers. Mm -hmm. We spent five years gathering data and writing tons of articles and an 820-page book. So mission accomplished, okay? We also know that ufology is not the end of it all, that this is much more complicated. Mm -hmm. It involves all of the contact modalities. And if I may give you an example of another medical doctor, Okay, Um, she's writing a chapter for a new book. Okay, Um, uh, did I mention the new book yet, or not really? Um, Our 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 new book from the new organization, Consciousness and Contact Research Institute, is going to be published in uh, September of 2020. A, A greater reality is that what it's called? Correct. It's titled "A Greater Reality: The New Paradigm of Consciousness, the Paranormal, and the Contact Modalities." And it's going to be three volumes, so it's going to be three 820-page books, Mm -hmm. okay? So it's going to be huge. Uh, Half of the article is going to be by PhD academics, the other half by experiencers. And let me give you… Let me just interject real fast again. So beyond UFOs, my understanding was after you published it, you were going to follow up on that. Now, I just assumed it would have been in the same line or beyond UFOs too or something like that, but instead… You're sort of shifting the, the the conversation, but what about the actual research? Is it is it is it going to be in line, like a continuation of um, the the work that you did there? Well, it's it's similar methodology, except our focus is not just on UFOs. It's going to be now on individuals trying to identify the individuals that have had major paranormal experiences, people that have had contact. Uh, via near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, UFOs, ghosts and spirits, uh, people that uh, have had automatic writing, channeling, uh, orbs, poltergeists, uh, contact via CE5, mediumship, telepathy, intuition, uh, lucid contact via lucid dreams, telekinesis, clairvoyance, precognition, retrocognition, energy healing. Uh, all of these types of experiences involve a manipulation of space-time. So, um, hallucinogenic journeys, remote viewing. Um, what we're trying to do is to identify the major experiencers and, uh, and, and then do in-depth studies similar to what we did with free. Okay, We want to bombard them with tons of um, quantitative questionnaires and qualitative questionnaires and then a formal structured interview. So it's similar methodology, except our focus is not on UFOs anymore. It's because we know that that is not the proper way to do it because these people are having a whole smorgasbord of paranormal experiences. Now, let me give you an illustration of this, okay? Um, We're also doing a a documentary, which is going to be coming out in 2021. Again, it's going to have over 40 PhD academics and over 40 experiencers, major experiencers, and researchers, people that are not PhDs but uh, that are uh, researching all of this phenomenon. And uh, we interviewed this medical doctor, okay? This medical doctor has had 12 UFO, uh, she's seen 12 UFOs, okay? Several of them were huge uh, crafts. Um, three of them were seen with her husband. And she described it, uh, these, these three with her husband, like these manta-shaped type of crafts, uh, a little bit similar to, to like triangles, that uh, were like more than a mile wide, uh, went right over them very, very slowly with no noise except a very, very low humming, tiny humming type of sound. She, uh, and one of the experiences, it went so low that she saw the whole bottom of this object, okay? She's had two out-of-body experiences. She's had two near-death experiences. One of those near-death experiences I want to be able to give some detail on because um, it was just unbelievable what what she described. Uh, After her second near-death experience and she began to return to work in her hospital, she began to seeing all these ghosts and spirits in the hospital. And that is extremely common of people that have had not only near-death experiences, but also people that have seen UFOs and have had contact with non-human intelligence. Once they've had these major contact experiences, all of a sudden they're seeing ghosts and spirits. Um, There was a a man named uh, uh, David uh, Twitchell who has a radio show. He interviewed me today, right? And so out of the blue, he goes to me. uh, I said, have you seen UFOs? He says, yes. I said, have you had paranormal experiences? He said, yes. Have you had out-of-body experiences? He says, yes, a whole bunch of them. Have you seen ghosts or spirits? He says, yes. I said, well, you meet that criteria of a major experiencer. 
Twitter. Okay, and this is a man that's interviewing me. Okay, but yet he's more commonly known for UFOs, you know, for a UFO radio show. And so this medical doctor uh, has had seen Sasquatch three times. Okay, and um, um, so you talk to her, it's like all of these paranormal experiences, but she's not the only one. Um, in my position, so is, I Bigfoot, get, is Bigfoot the only kind of cryptid out there, or are there other cryptids? That are well, we, 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 we asked that question in our survey, a uh, free experience research study of large, hairy animal. Okay? We didn't say, you know, Bigfoot. We just described the physicality of it. You know, large, hairy animal. And mm-hmm. there was uh, about 225 people that said yes. Now, we didn't follow up. Uh, in terms of what type it was, what happened, and all those details, because we already bombarded these people with 600 questions, Mm -hmm. quantitative questions, and 70 open-ended questions. And the biggest complaint that we got from these people was that we just asked too many questions. But literally, you could ask thousands of questions. Like, well, what, what about moving forward? Do you think you incorporate more of cryptids? I mean, there there are so many re- reported encounters. I mean, you have Hatman, Shadow People, Thunderbird, Chupacabra. Well, well, one thing that we couldn't do with the UFO contact experiencers is to do structured interviews, okay? What we want to be able to do, once we've identified people like that medical doctor, and there's literally hundreds of people that I've spoken with that are just like her, okay? From um, attorneys, uh, pilots, politicians, uh, PhD academics, uh, you name it. I've uh, spoken with all of them. They've had all of these major experiences. So the first task is to identify these people. Then uh, that's via small uh, questions, like maybe 25 questions. Um, And then after that, once they're identified, then to uh, get the people who volunteer to participate with us and ask them a ton of questions, quantitative questions, Mm -hmm. and also open-ended questions. Okay, where they ask to write out the details of of various questions. And then the last piece is to do structured interviews where we ask all of these people the same question. We want to be able to record it and then uh, uh, to um, to uh, um, uh, write out the details of of the audio. So uh, then we want to be able to do to sophisticated um, word query analysis via a PhD in information sciences, Dr. Raul Valverde. Uh, who is also an experiencer. So he's been trained to use these sophisticated um, computer uh, technology to extrapolate certain words and be able to test out certain hypotheses. So uh, we envision this process from the beginning to the very end uh, might take about five years to complete. And then after that, it's actually publishing all of our data and putting it out to the public for free, unlike some other organizations that do all this research and they keep everything hidden. We don't do that. We're making it available to the public, um, just like in our book, uh, Beyond UFOs. Uh, um, it's, it's available for everyone to go read our data. Well, what, how much, what influence does the, the time-space, I guess, paradox, that, for us at least, because you're describing that, that time really isn't how we perceive it. How, how does that play into the connection between these uh, ET entities. Okay, let me give you a clear example, okay? Uh, Mm -hmm. You know of the name of Dr. Jacques Vallée, okay? Mm -hmm. He is by far, by far, no one comes close to him now, the number one living ufology researcher in the world. And he probably was 30 years ago, he he and Alan Hynek, okay? And so... um, there's there there is um, a, 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 a podcast on YouTube called New Thinking Aloud. Okay, uh, years ago it was titled Thinking Aloud. It would it was hosted by Dr. Jeffrey Mishloff, who received a PhD in Berkeley in parapsychology. This is a man that's been you know focusing on the paranormal and consciousness you know for almost forty years. Dr. Jeffrey Mishloff. So he asked Dr. Valet. He says these grays. Okay, it's seems like they are able to, uh, to uh, uh, oh no, he says, do you believe that these short grays are interdimensional beings? Because in so much Dr. Mack's uh, 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 literature, and, I, and uh, he's spoken with Dr. Mack many, many, many times, he mentioned that these short grays are bringing people to other realities, and many of the experiences are multidimensional type of experiences. So he asked Dr. Valet, do you think that these little grays might be multidimensional? 
Okay? So Dr. Valet paused for a second and he says, What what we don't un- we just don't understand space time. Okay? Now by answering that question, Valet is saying that the whole arena of UFO contact experiences involves a manipulation of space time, but we just don't understand it. Okay, so this interview was 35 years ago, and Valet really hasn't changed, you know, since way back when. He always suspected that this is much more complicated than mainstream ufology. And uh, he also feels the same way that I feel about mainstream ufology. I I really don't want to touch it with a 10-foot pole. Mm -hmm. Um, But... um, but uh, uh, but anyway, that's an example within the field of ufology of this concept concept of space time. That um, that uh, for example, near death experiences by definition, these people are having multi dimensional type of experiences. Out of body experiences by definition is a manipulation of space time. Okay, it's multi dimensional experience. All of a sudden, your spirit, your consciousness, whatever you might want to call it, is. Uh, outside of your body, you're looking at your body underneath, and for many people, they go into other realities, okay? Um, and, and in terms of ghosts and spirits, again, by definition, there's a manipulation of space-time because you, you see the spirit of Aunt Sally or the ghost of Aunt Sally right in front of you, and there are literally you know, hundreds of thousands of these stories that have been published in books over the many years, and, and how could Aunt Sally, who died 10 years ago, appears right in front of you, you know? And all you need to do is go to YouTube. YouTube and and find out uh, this type in this topic called post death experiences. You'll be bombarded with experiences of post death experiences involving the deceased. Okay, so all of them, including hallucinogenic journeys via ayahuasca, uh, DMT, uh, psilocybin, whatever. Half of the people in um, Dr. Rich Roxman's study on DMT had contact with non-human intelligence, okay? Remote viewing, by definition, is a manipulation of space-time, okay? So, what I'm getting at is that all of these phenomena, okay, um, are are seen by many individuals as very separate and distinct phenomena. But what they all of them have in common is a manipulation of space-time. And Jacques Vallée and Dr. Edgar Mitchell knew about this over 35 years ago. And also, uh, um, very soon in our documentary, we're going to be having the interview of, um, of, uh, um, of what's his name, from coast to coast. Um, um, one of the main hosts there, goodness, what's his name again? Um, George Norrie? George, no, no, Knapp, Knapp. Oh, George, George Knapp. George Knapp. He, he said that he was part of the... Um, um, the Skinwalker Ranch team that was investigating it. He said that Edgar Mitchell wasn't the only astronaut. He said well, there were several other astronauts involved. Jack Vallée was there. Um, like three of the members of the free, free organization were also involved. And, and what he said is that um, what he learned from all of that, and subsequent years later, he says, if we just focus on UFOs, we're still going to be remain clueless because we've learned almost nothing just focusing on UFOs per se. So he says, the, the evidence that, that we all want can, will be found somewhere else, not the usual place. Well, if you just focus on uh, mainstream materialist UFOs, I'm asking you a question. What have we learned in the last 80 years about that? Right, exactly. We're, we're hitting our head against the wall. Okay, correct, correct. Mm-hmm. Now, in our... Um, five-year research study of 4,200 people that have seen UFOs and have had had contact with non-human intelligence, we were able to uh, decipher uh, hundreds of, of facts and, 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 um, and research findings that mainstream ufology was totally clueless about. Why? Because they never did that study. Okay, they never, uh, uh, outside of asking uh, 50 questions to these uh, mainly abductees, they would have known that only one third of the people actually had abductions. The other two thirds did not. Of those one third that actually had an abduction, 70% now call themselves contactees. Why? Because in, while initially 37% viewed their experiences as highly negative, over time, these individuals had many additional contact experiences. As a matter of fact, 40% had 20 or more experiences. Now, we did this other statistical graph that showed the more experiences you had, the more positive you viewed the experiences. Right. That's Why? a topic of discussion that's come up quite a bit on the show, actually. Well, we, we were able to prove it with thousands of people. 
This is not just one person, two people, three people, four people. Uh, for example, with the short grace, we had 1,300 people that experiences with the short grace. Okay? Right. But there's also uh, plenty of work that came before free, like that of John Mack. I mean, that, but that, wasn't, that wasn't statistical. Uh, John, John's Mac, um, Dr. Mack's book, Passport to the Cosmos, had uh, like 20 case studies. Do you, you understand what I'm getting at? Exactly. And that's it. And these were interviews of these people, of these 20 people, and then he wrote up like a little chapter on these people. Okay? So that, 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 that is um, like anecdotal case studies of individuals. What we did, we asked quantitative and qualitative uh, questions to people all over the world. We had responses from over 100 countries. And one of the statistical analysis that we did is that um, we had a PhD statistician in our group. We grouped all the answers in geographic areas, uh, five geographic areas. We lumped all the questions from the U.S., from Canada, from the U.K., from mainland Europe, and then we combined Australia and New Zealand. <laughs> and guess what? Their responses to almost all of the questions didn't, uh, the, uh, didn't vary by 10 percentage point. Okay, it was 10 percentage point the maximum that they varied in how they responded to the questions. That means that people were responding the same exact way to each and every question, no matter where they lived. Well, in reference to the book that's coming out, A Greater Reality, some of these more supernatural happenings, hallucinations, and particularly healings, all of this you're saying is is somehow in, interconnected with time, space, and the nature of reality itself. And so for me, abstractly, it sounds fascinating, but there's a big gap. It's like, okay, so what is the actual connection between time and and the ability to heal or to connect psychically? Well, the, um, the Institute for Noetic Sciences uh, has done several um, scientific academic studies on what is commonly called energy healing, okay? And they've been able to demonstrate that, yes, it does work. Um, there have also been laboratory studies of, um, of um, um, I think it was like bacteria in different dishes. Uh, people would put their intention and the, their energy on these dishes, and uh, and it would significantly decrease the number of bacteria that were there. So uh, I'm not an expert in that area, so I'm not the right person to, to ask. But yes, we're just in the infinite stages of beginning to do that type of research. Um, and, and, and that's why, again, you know, we have more questions than answers. And if anybody goes and on your radio show with, with the answers, uh, run away from them because we don't even know what questions to ask, let alone what answers. Fair enough. When is the book coming out anyway? Uh, the book is, uh, is going to come out in September of this year. And again, this is not going to be a book about the CCRI academic research study because it's going to take five years <clears throat> for us to slowly go through the whole process of, of, um, of, of, uh, of the research study. Um, we, we're still starting the research methodology as, as we're talking right now. Okay. okay? So, uh, but however, what this book, first book is going to do is to introduce the topic via academics and experiencers like like that medical doctor that i told you about mm -hmm. uh, she's writing a chapter on uh for our book and it's going to talk primarily about her ndes but she's also going to be mentioning her obes uh her ufo contact experiences and her ghost experiences and also her sasquatch experiences so the purpose of having all these experiences write their chapters these are all experiencers that have had multiple experiences via the contact modalities okay so like like our first book says is beyond ufos and like our second book says it's a greater reality right aside from you know all of this work or maybe it's connected to that but for you personally like what what are what are like the, the most important couple of things that you've learned in your life that that you you would really like to bestow upon others well, one is that whatever intelligence, as I told folks, I had two and a half years of nonstop paranormal experiences, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, one of them involved being taken out of my body while I was driving my car at 8.30 in the morning in the middle of a traffic jam, being shown all of the contact modalities, uh, how they work, that they're all interconnected via consciousness, and... Um, 
and, and, and a lot of other stuff, but I won't go into those details. Uh, but the free organization was formed within 48 hours of that event. Whatever this intelligence is, uh, Mary Rodwell got an email that I'd sent her six months ago. And she said, Ray, um, I just got your email that I sent you six months ago. We then talked to like 1.30 in the morning on Skype. And then the next morning, I got a phone call from Dr. Rudy Shields, who Mary had hooked me up with. And then uh, uh, Dr. Edgar Mitchell, Rudy gave me uh, Edgar's phone call, and he invited me to his home. So Free was uh, formed at his home 40 hours, 48 hours after my last experience. So what, these is exp- your guiding, what is your guiding principle in life? Uh, well, what I wanted to also go into the second component is that um, um, my ne- a series of near-death related type of experiences. Mm-hmm. And that taught me through actual experiences, not through reading books, through actual experiences, that I'm an eternal spiritual being. Okay, and that uh, we live in a multi-dimensional reality that we just don't exist, and that we just like someone that has had an NDE, you should not be afraid of death. Okay, um, that uh, we're just here to to live and learn and to make mistakes, but that we need to be able to begin to do formal academic research on the experiencers. That's that's the key because they hold they hold the the golden nugget. Uh, the the key to be able to understand what is the true nature of our reality. So the, that is sort of my, my guiding principle. I'm on a mission. My mission is to focus on the experiencers of the paranormal contact experiences, including UFO contact experiencers. All right, Ray, thank you so much for coming on again. You're very welcome. All right, absolutely. So if you want to find out more, you can go to consciousnessandcontact.org. Coming up on the other side, we have Ryushin Malone and man, we're going to take a ride on the other side here. So get ready to go into hyperdrive on the fastest hunk of junk in this side of the galaxy. This is Alan B. Smith for Paranormal Now. We will be right back. You lost in a bad way, starting to let go. Your official contact for the best alternative talk on the planet. KGRARadio.com. Lost in a bad way Starting to let go Gone too far the wrong way Can take it all back now Been lost in a bad way I've gotta let you go Welcome back to Paranormal Now. Okay. So, are you ready? We are going to take a trip around the Earth, inside the Earth, and where else the stars may take us. But before we get to our next guest, Ray uh, Hernandez just wanted to clarify that if you want to get in touch with him, just email him info at experiencer.com. Org. Ryushin, how are you? Very good, thank you. How are All you? Right. Very good. good. So I think what I'm going to do is, because there's, there's so much, and we only have so much time, so much yes. to cover, so little time. Yes. Why don't you tell us who you are, um, what you do as an independent researcher, and, sure. and then take it away. Okay. Uh, my name is Ryushin Malone. Uh, I'm a 39-year-old Zen teacher. Um, I've been, I was born at a Buddhist monastery in the Catskill Mountains. Uh, my parents were both Buddhists. Um, hi mom, I love you. Um, I started sitting meditation at the age of 16, um, and have done approximately two and a half years sitting meditation in monasteries, including the one I was born at. Um, I started teaching uh, in Bangor, Maine, in 2017, 2016, um, one day while I was sitting, I had an encounter. 
uh, two beings that were translucent appeared in front of me, and I felt a touch underneath my chin, which raised my head. Another being stepped around the side of it with an iron rod, a metal long pole, and pushed it up against my neck for a few seconds, and then it let go and then disappeared. Then the creature in front of me dropped my head and it stepped back and turned right and then disappeared. Well, after that experience, I was quite moved. Um, I went home and I started researching every aspect of the subject. I collected everything all the information i could possibly get on the the subject well did it did that experience affect you emotionally or or yes it did it was very moving um you know for the first time in my life i i realized that they were indeed real and a, um crazy it's, feeling, right? it started my whole experience my whole um you know research on the subject so a oh go ahead just starting, uh, just starting my research in summer of 2017, the Nazca alien mummies were released by Gaia TV. They found two species of aliens in the Nazca Peru desert, which are currently on display at a university in Peru. A week after they came out, I connected the two-foot-tall alien beings to King Akhenaten the Egyptian king, and Queen Nefertiti. Uh, what I realized is, is that they were the, actually the same species of aliens all over King Akhenaten, Queen Nefertiti. Well, do, uh, really quick, do you remember what university it was? I don't. It's, it's in Peru. Um, you can find it um, if you go to the-alien-project dot com i believe it's dot com um yes you can google that uh the alien project and um they have they are the ones who found this the aliens the two different species and they are aliens they they're definitely aliens <laughs> well but, we've, uh, had, we've had some issues with presenting uh beings as aliens and really they it's just a mummy of a child so you know it's 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 a slippery well, slip when we go down they, that road uh they've they've had x-rays done they're they're definitely reptilian in you know nature they're they're like the birds or dinosaurs mm-hmm. um there've been dna testing on them uh they're 32% uh, human dna which means that they're not from here uh, fruit fly is ninety eight percent, you know, DNA, human DNA. So it's it's just, uh, and not only that, but um, I've also connected these these uh, tiny beings to uh, video evidence of an alien found in the Russian snow uh, in Russia with a dead alien creature who is the same species, the two foot tall alien species but i've also connected the other species the other species called maria who is a five foot tall alien being with three fingers and three toes um i connected her to a picture found on the internet uh with also three fingers and i've connected her to um a video ebe uh in Enninger, Enninger, yeah. The, yeah. Okay, so, so a lot of this is sleuthing that you've done on your own, and, and yes, putting these. Okay, this is you know for my own looking around, paying attention. Is this the uh, was it the Cusco Institute in Peru? Um, or it was- uh, yeah, I think you know it was in Cusco. Yes. Okay. I'm, not sh- I'm not sure which university it, it is, but, um, yeah. Okay. They're on display. Have you have you taken a trip down to Peru? No, I have not, no. Are you planning on it? I hope so, yeah, at some point. Um, you know, as soon as uh, things start to happen, you know, the, the, it, 
the information gets out to the public, um, it's been totally ignored. I mean, the scientists down, the researchers down there have been totally ignored. And they're going like, what, what's going on? And I've been ignored too. I've been ignored by uh, every ufologist, uh, science researcher. Well, tell us about the your hypothesis about the Orion Belt line, line and the Nazca lines. Um, well, um, I found a map, the Nazca line map. That's what you have to look for in Google. Nazca lines map. Mm-hmm. I printed it out. I circled the three main points, and I realized at that moment that it was Orion. I thought it was Orion's belt, but I looked again, and I was wrong. It would take me a year and a half to get get the correct configuration, but uh, I finally did. And what it is, is it's a three-dimensional star map of the Orion Group's territory markings. And the only way to view their territory is actually you have to be standing behind Orion looking through the constellation Orion to our sun, Sol, which is in the Nazca lines. And then behind behind our sun is the, the, the three constellations in the map, Scorpio, Libra, and Virgo. Um, it would be very unlikely for aboriginaries to say, hey, let's draw some lines, but from the perspective of standing behind Orion. You know, um, also uh, Betty Hill's um, star map of Zeta Reticuli, she was allegedly shown a map, and that map turned out to have to be standing behind the Zeta uh, star system looking through to our sun, just like this map just like the the orion lines so yes i saw the nazca lines and i renamed them the orion lines uh no one no one said anything no one said anything I, i've shown thousands of people no one writes back saying you know you're wrong or you're right or maybe or um a, 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 not even like a hello by the researchers who you know, are are way into this, so it's it's very strange. It's very strange. Okay, so what what's the point behind that? What what does that mean that they line up? It what what they are are territory markings. They're to ward off other extraterrestrials to say, "Hey, this is our planet. Go away. Stay away." The Orion Group. Um, when I looked it up and I knew it was Orion, so I went researching, looking for more information on Orion. I came across the Orion Group. The Orion Group is a satanic force who take over star systems. I know it sounds funny, but that's what I found. And uh, it makes sense because Stonehenge is aligned to Orion. It's part of Orion constellation. Um, uh, the Egyptian pyramids align to Orion's belt. Um, I found uh, the Orion lines on the big island of Hawaii. Um, and the Nazca lines are also Orion. Uh, what's the chance that this is just a civilization that that was just far more advanced than we are now? Um, I don't... Um, who drew the lines, you mean, or had that connect? I don't yeah, think so. Yeah. I think I think that they come from other places. Okay. Um, I think there's it's multifaceted. There's so much information. Um, I think we're dealing with time travelers from us from the future. We're also dealing with alien beings, uh, extraterrestrials who come from different places, not only different planets, but possibly different universes, other universes. Uh, and not only that, but other dimensions as well. Okay. So it, you know, it's a it's a wide. O- it's a very there's a lot there's a lot going on here. Yeah. So for everybody listening, go to www.the-alien-project.com if you're an English speaker slash en, and that will bring up the page that we're referring to. 
Um, see, I, with the Nazca alien mummies. With the Nazca alien mummies. And, yes. you know, I, I always wonder, even with the, the Nazca alien mummies, or well, any oddly shaped elongated skull mummy. Mm-hmm. Yes. If, 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 if the cubic centimeters are larger than a typical human head, which right. you know, then you can't explain. Well, um, uh, as what, soon if, as, what if it's another yeah. species? Because we've had so right. many variations of hominins on this planet. Um, the evidence is pointing uh, to it being reptile. So that would show up in the DNA eventually, right? Well, it it, it is. Um, of course it would. But uh, the bone structure, um, I, I, I follow this biologist who's been, you know, hands-on with these things, uh, watching his work. And he's coming up with all kinds of, you know, it's, it's definitely a, a reptile, a dinosaur-like. So uh, I think he's, I think they're saying it's pterodactyl. So, well, see, that's interesting because evolutionarily, right? We we typically think that birds are the ancestors of of reptiles, right? But it, it also had a a, uh, a metal plate implanted in its chest, and the bigger ones with the three the the, the larger alien species mm-hmm. uh, has metal plates in its hand. So they were extremely intelligent, uh, super intelligent. Now, did they originate from Earth? I have no idea. Um, um, you know, uh, and went off and exploring and come back and do that? I have no idea. Are they from somewhere else? That's possible. Yes. I mean, I, when, I'm I on, when I'm on the website, they really look almost like, like E.T. the extraterrestrial from the movie. Right, yeah. Um, you know what it was when when they first came out in the summer of 2017. Mm-hmm. Um, I I was very skeptical myself. I was looking at them like, nah, come on, that's that's fake. That's you know, plaster Paris, whatever. You know, it, it's it's fake, right? And then I start looking through the X-rays, and I'm like, whoa, you can't fake nature. You can't fake nature. I mean, one of these little little beings' heads. It's about uh, two to three inches wide. And you have an x-ray that is in depth and in detail of a living being. Impossible to, uh, (laughs) you know, carve up at a ceramics class. You know, it's impossible to fake nature. You can't do it. That's what, that's what sold me. And I was sitting down watching a, a, Something on Netflix, uh, a documentary on Egypt, and poof, there they were, sitting with King Akhenaten. I was like, "That's them. They're with this. They're the same species." Well, I certainly believe that it, that it's possible that somewhere along the way, somebody took some uh, beings, if you will, right, mummified, and locked them away because it undermines their work and the paradigm whether it be archaeological or biological i i can certainly accept that i think the the question is, is that with the proliferation of archaeology um you would think there would be a rogue archaeologist who says uh uh i'm sharing this right so how did these get out uh they got out through gaia tv somebody somebody got them out onto the internet and nobody's picked it up except for me and a few other people i mean some people down there in peru are starting to get a you know a hold of it and it's being shown in a you know in a university right now and where are all where are all the news reporters where are all the scientists uh, coming in to say yes oh wow look at that is it possible not even a, not even a, oh uh you know, is it possible? Right, but how is it being you presented know? is the question. Because like, if, if you present something like this and you say, this is an alien body, then your, right. your mainstream um, you know, uh, uh, you know, researchers, uh, scientists, are, are going to run away from that. Now, of if, course, it, but... if it's presented neutrally, like, okay, what is this? Right. What, do you think that they would then approach the subject? Um. Uh probably not because people don't believe in that kind of thing 
There's, there, are they are they afraid? Do you think of the of the answer? Who knows? Maybe they're getting paid really well. Oh, possibly, and obviously, grants um, drive motivation, um, or or keep your mouth shut, or keep your mouth shut. It goes, and and it could be one and the same thing. So, I certainly believe that that's a possibility. Or- you know, I you know, people like to call them UFOs or UAPs or the phenomenon. That's not what I work with. I work with extraterrestrial beings. Uh, I'm a xenoanthropologist and an ETVologist, an extraterrestrial vehicle ology. Um, Do you I've think typed, I've, oh, I've, no, typed, I've typed about twelve different species from video and picture. Um, I figured out how the aliens speak from four videos, uh, four different species of aliens talking. They make bird-like calls. They sound like birds. And, uh, like, a, like, a, have, like, a chir- like a chirping. Well, yeah, they sound like birds. Now, do you have any audio recordings of that? I don't on me, no, but they're on my website. Okay. The, the OrionLines.com. The OrionLines.com. Okay. Great. There's a lot of information there. Um, you know, don't turn away so fast. If you see something that you're like, ah, that's all baloney, just, 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 just keep going, keep looking. Uh, you know, everything that I have collected is a, after careful observation. Um, I, I have, I've been sitting meditation since I was 16. I'm a very good observer as to and understanding of the nature of reality. Is this true? Is one of the core questions a Buddhist asks themselves. Is this true? And that's, that's what I, that's what I used. I used, is this true? And I went through all the evidence and, um, determined that, yes, there's a lot of evidence. There's, uh, a lot of evidence going on. I've, I've, I'm one of the first ufologists to match a UFO with another UFO. I've also uh, solved the Great Pyramids. I'm sorry. So, uh, what do you, you've solved them? Yeah. <laughs> what, what, what do you mean? How they were built? Or sure. Uh, no, what they were used for. What what they were. Um, so okay. Um, on December 7th, uh, 2018, something was leaked. It was leaked that there was an unprecedented, unprecedented amount of activity happening at Area 51. Okay, planes and all kinds of aircraft. Uh, and lizard people were coming out of the ground. December 7th, 2018. Lizard people were coming out of the ga- ground. And I was like, oh, wow, that's interesting information, right? <laughs> so I held on to that. And uh, 12 days later, on December 19th, 2018, a gigantic pyramid-shaped craft appeared above the Pentagon. We have three different videos of the object hovering above the Pentagon. That told me everything. That told me that that yeah. information of, of them clearing house was probably correct, and that the aliens showed up, exposed themselves, and showed up at the Pentagon trying to find out what the F uh, these people, these human beings, were doing. So, it was the same object that appeared over the Kremlin in 2009, a huge, gigantic, pyramid-shaped craft. Um, now, as soon as I saw that craft, I knew it was real. I knew they had that craft, like a large pyramid-shaped craft, and I instantly thought of Stargate. It's like Stargate. When the pyramid lands on the pyramid, the pyramid ship lands on the pyramid, and I go up, and I look up the uh, blueprint to the uh, Great Pyramid of Giza, and I'm like, oh! It's a water well. They were water harvesting the Nile River. It was collecting at the bottom, 
and it was used for clean, drinkable water. This this uh, pyramid would show up, land on the pyramid, and suck out water. So it was a gigantic water harvesting system. That's what the pyramids were, or at least the big one. Uh, and that's why is that it what the, sh- the shaft is going all the way up into the, the king's chamber. Right. Yeah. It's it's. I mean, if you look at it, if you look at the blueprint, mm-hmm. um, uh, the shafts that lead outward. Um, at the tops of the pyramid are actually connected to Orion and to the Draco star system, so the Alpha Draconians. But it it points to one specific star in the Draco constellation. It's called Thurbon. Thurbon is the Alpha Draconians' home star. Now, but how do, how do you how do you know that? Because that's the main star that it points to. That's the that's the star that it that, points to. So the, that's the draconian, the star. draconian star, home oh. star. Okay. That's where they come from. That's where the Draco the Draco come from. So, um, but it's funny because the Washington Monument in Washington aligns to Draco too, and then it reflects in the reflecting pool, but only for twelve minutes. But the United States Air Force Memorial in the back of the Pentagon aligns to Orion's belt at the same time, just like the Great Pyramid aligning to Orion and Draco. So that that told me everything. That told me that our whole civilization is based behind these beings. Our, our whole system is being operated under the, their supervision or guidance. It's in secret. And it's crazy because... Um, uh, and it's so frustrating, too. It's so frustrating. Are they the ones that created humans? Do, do you believe that? I don't know. I don't know. I know that somebody created humans... Um, I figured out what was in the bag. Do you know what's in the bag? The, the, all the Sumerian people, all those uh, Sumerian people walking out the gods with the bag, and everybody's like, oh, it's an, it's an air uh, oxygen tank or whatever. Yeah, no, that's not what it is. <laughs> so they have the pineal gland, and they're placing the pineal gland into the tree of life. The tree of life is um, either us or all life on Earth, um, including plants, animals, everything, or us. I don't know. Um, but they were taking the pineal gland and putting it into the tree of life, and they were holding a, a purse, a bag. Well, I found the same um, like representation of a uh, Aztec in the Aztec, um, you know. Um, What's up? Mm -hmm. mythology yeah exactly um so he has seeds and he's planting seeds he's wearing like a big costume like you know a big godlike costume and he's planting seeds and what does he have in his hand he has a purse he has a bag so i knew that oh what's in the bag seeds seeds are in the bag Mm -hmm. so that's what that's what i cross reference between those two explain the significance of the pineal gland Sure, the pineal gland, I believe, results in intelligent thought and spiritual connectivity to, have, the, have, to the unconscious consciousness. It's, have you it's, heard of the, the stoned ape theory by Terence McKenna? It's a very, uh-huh. it's a very loose theory. Yeah. His idea was that you know we were you know hominids, but we were yes. living in the forests, and then when we had the courage to go out into the open fields Um, on cow patties. We found mushrooms. We ate those mushrooms. They had hallucinogenic effects. And that, that stuff. Yeah. Um, Well, I do, I do think it's, it's logical to assume that um, we start, we came out of the trees to collect flowers, to give as gifts to the females, which is interesting. I've, I've heard that, you know, or the males. Some of us like flowers. Or the males. Yeah, some of us like flowers. Yeah, that's right. But, you know, 
Um, uh, and that's what got us out of the trees. Right. Um, I'm not sure, and I don't know, and whatever. All I know is that we were we have been messed with. We have been tinkered with this whole time. All of us. Mm-hmm. There's no doubt in my mind. So, okay, I mean, so so it wasn't a one-time intervention. Yes, that's right. We, we've been. I mean, I, I, I'm I'm pretty sure they. I mean, I'm pretty sure, positively sure, they have time travel, and that involves um, um, offsetting spatial diversions. Okay, so besides the reptilians species, what other or how many other species do you think are there? Do you see the stars in the sky? <laughs> Well, not right now, but yes. And especially in New York City, it's not always so easy. Uh, I, gr- I grew up right right in Jersey there. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I grew up right across the uh, George Washington. Oh, uh-huh. not right. You see the stars in the sky. There are as many different species mm-hmm. as there are stars in the sky. That's how many species there are. That's actually kind of believable because, you know, what's in the sky, as immense as it may seem, is still just a fraction of the of the stars in this galaxy. <laughs> well, in this, even in this universe, um, it, you know, I I strongly believe that we're in a multi universe, uh, um, and and it's basically just balls, tons of tons of universes that are balls, like balls clumped together and it just goes on and on and on and so on like and the, the multiverse yeah right it's just like a bunch of marbles mm-hmm. like a the infinite amount of marbles just chilling out together that's all that's all that's what i think the multiverse looks like but i do have a theory as to how the universe came into existence mm-hmm. do you want to hear it sure no go ahead yeah okay just think of think of nothing emptiness then imagine a wormhole opening. The wormhole starts spewing out light and energy and then creates a large ball I call the white hole. And then it reaches a point where it explodes and creates the universe. That's how I believe the uh, universe was created. But that's just the theory. But isn't that very similar to the Big Bang? It, it, it is. I mean, but it's before the Big Bang. A wormhole aperture opening and then spilling out um, energy and light, um, you know, creating a new universe. I think that's where all these black holes are going. Yeah, but that's the greatest, the greatest conundrum is that whether you believe in God or believe in the, the Big Bang or, or whatever it is, is that whatever that origin is, where did that origin come from? Well, it's not necessarily a conundrum considering that we do have time travel. You know that, right? Oh, you're saying humans have time travel? Yes, or? yes, we do. Yes, we have now. time travel, and um, and because of having time travel, it actually changes the nature of reality. So, okay, we, so, so we basically, live, every we time live, time travel, we're, we are affecting the time space continuum. But those of us living in the continuum. We wouldn't even notice the changes around us because it would just be natural. Yes, we wouldn't. Yes, that's right. Yes, that's true. It's like our our own history could be rewritten as we're going. Right. No clue. Exactly. But then who who in what time period has this technology right now? um, Well, I believe they're not they're not all like showing up right now because we haven't um, actually made or agreed upon a present moment, an actual present moment where we all sit down and go, yep, we have time travel. Okay. Well, we need a present moment. And considering that this is the present moment for us, we, we need an agreed upon time to say that this is the present moment for the observer, the time traveler to return to. I'm sure they have that in all their secret, you know, uh, area 51 S four dash two. The Looking Glass device, the Orion Cube. The Orion Cube is a quantum time viewing device. It allows the viewer to um, see past, present, and future events. Right, um, and it was a, it was a gift by the Orion, the people from Orion. Okay, and see, but that that's a 
benevolent thing, I, I, I suppose, as a gift. <laughs> so are these beings, extraterrestrials, have you, are they benevolent, um, all of them? Or are, are there really entities out there that, that seek to, to harm human and interfere um yes uh yes there are three three different types of aliens visiting us there's there's ones who um uh don't mind us at all they're not interested in the rat race and they're more interested in in metals or researching or looking around um uh and then we have the other two the other two who is who is a great part of our system um more than we know i i believe it has to it all has to do with the the balance have you ever heard of the balance the the devil and god uh good and bad well the balance is actually real yes and they are actually aliens so i think that's what the whole balance thing has been about um yes um well it's it's quite complicated and um, I, from my research, um, I found the, you know, the whole cattle mutilation thing. Mm -hmm. So, well, we found three bodies that are human, um, who have, who have the same marks and they've been, they call it the human mutilations. Right. Yep. Um, and what I realized is, is that they were actually adrenochrome harvesting beings, so yes, they, I've they, heard that before. They've been, they've been torturing uh, animals and human beings to collect adrenochrome and, and blood, um, organs, uh, gland, nodes. That's what they've been doing. Um, you know, it, it's like, <laughs> it's not really a big deal. I mean, everybody's got to eat, but um, since we, are, we have the ability to say, hey, no. Um, that there's a difference, you know, that's a difference. That's, that's when things, you know, now that the public is aware of it, mm -hmm. like myself, um, I told them, no, I mean, I went down to the, the Pentagon and I have a, a sign with one of the, uh, human mutilations, um, and, you know, telling them to go F themselves because, uh, that's not okay. And we're not, we're not food. Yeah. So, so it, it, there's a lot to it. There's a lot more than you, you could possibly imagine. Um, I, so after I found out that they were eating people, <coughs> so some what, of some wait. of them, some of them, some of them have been. Yes, they have been. Well, let me just pause there. You're saying eating people, but it's mm -hmm. not exactly eating people. It's well harvesting. They're, they're harvesting. They're they're torturing human beings and and cattle and horses. Uh, from 45 minutes to an hour uh, to produce, to have the body really, you know, get those juices flowing, you know. And, and I can tell you exactly how they do it. You want to know how? Go for it. You ever seen that, that funny movie, Fire in the Sky? You ever, ever notice why they changed Travis Walton's story? I'll tell you. They changed it because they showed us exactly how they've been adrenochrome harvesting human beings. That's why. Well, why would that? That's why his story was different. When he wakes up inside of a cylinder-shaped ship, I knew that the cylinders, the cigar-shaped ships, were actually their harvesting ships. And well, then right. when why they, would, why would they want to show us that? To prepare us for the truth. Because we have we have three bodies. We have a man who was who was adrenochrome harvested in 1988, and then we have a female and a, a male who were found together um, uh, in 2007. Uh, and the numerous amount of stories, um, you know, and, and it's a big problem. And that's what I'm more concerned about. I mean, I know there are positive alien beings out there. But I'm more concerned about the ones who've been eating us. 
It still bothers me when you say eating us. <laughs> just, well, it's true. I mean, that's what they've been doing. It's not only just eating us. Yeah. They're torturing people. Okay, so... Well, do, we know that? do we know that, yes. though, so even yes. with cows? Yes, we have the bodies. Yes. We have the right. bodies. Right. It's we physical could, evidence. But couldn't they do, you know, have their version of morphine or some sort of um, yeah, unconscious in, inducing technique? Uh, ep- epinephrine? Um, it's not the same. It's not the same as no. as adrenochrome. What adrenochrome is, is it when adrenaline meets oxygen, it creates adrenochrome. You see, that's why the elite are all into this adrenochrome harvesting business. Because, well, uh, Orion is a satanic force. <laughs> you see where it's all leading to? It's all coming together. I, I kind of do. I kind of uh-huh. do. Uh-huh. Yeah. But, um, when you mean, when you say satanic, what do you mean literally? Well, the satanic practice is drinking the blood. Right, right. but when you say satanic, like, are, you, are you referring to the, the literal Satan or just the, the practice of that sort the, of... The practice. Yeah, okay. the practice. Mm-hmm. I don't know. I don't know who... I think Satan might be an alpha draconian, but I don't know. I know that, we're, that they're aliens for sure. But, um, you know, this is the true source of human sacrifice. This is why human sacrifice was being performed to the gods, because they were alien beings coming down here, and they were they were doing it in every single culture. And I believe, um, you know, I saw Stonehenge too. Stonehenge was an adrenochrome harvest clock. So when the sun fell between the heel stone, I believe that Orion would show up that night, and they would adrenochrome harvest uh, people on the slaughter stone. And I believe that some of the people, like the normal people, found out about it. And that's why Stonehenge was partially destroyed. That's why there's mass graves at Stonehenge. And that's why the elite rebuilt it in 1901 to honor Orion. But it goes deeper. I believe that uh, the uh, Nazi Holocaust was actually an adrenochrome harvest. I don't know how they did it, but that's what it was. And um, after I found out, you know, because they had all those flying saucers, all those UFOs, and the Nazis did. I mean, we have about an hour's worth of film footage of, you know, Nazi UFOs flying all over the place. Um, uh, and, And it really made me think, like, huh, why just kill them when you can kill them and trade for technology? It made sense. So I was like, okay, well, that's a very interesting observation. Well, you know, I mean, they have all these UFOs, um, and then they did the whole Holocaust thing. And then um, a few months ago, like a year after, I realized, well, maybe that's possible. Maybe they did, maybe the uh, Nazi Holocaust was actually an adrenochrome harvest in trade for technology with these aliens from Orion. And lo and behold, I discover that the Nazi death march, the pathways leading to each of the death camps, was in the shape of Orion. So wait, okay, you know, because I I have Jewish family members, so I have to say here that the, the Holocaust itself is, there was still racism. So... Oh, of course. But I think, I believe it was more of a revenge. I believe it was revenge for Moses leading the Jews out of Egypt under Orion rule. The Orion group. Mm -hmm. And I believe it was revenge 5,000 years later. But that's just a theory. Revenge by the... Aliens, yeah. The Orion group. Okay, and whoever the elite, whoever you know, whoever is making the deals with these things. All right. So when I saw that the, um, you know, the Nazi death marches were in the shape of Orion, it was a scary, unsettling feeling. It was very unsettling. Um, this is and then very, very unsettling to me because I mean, you yeah, the extermination. I, I know a, it. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. You know, and I, uh, you know, I went down to the Holocaust Museum in Washington, D.C., and I showed them that, you know, not only were the Nazi death marches in the shape of Orion to honor Orion, but 
the Nazi, uh, but the secret underground railroads in the United States of America are in the exact same shape of Orion. Okay, so just just to clarify, then, sorry, if sorry, if I'm jumping around here. Mm-hmm. Um, the the approach to I don't know who Hitler or someone in the Nazi Party was. This is what we will give you if you harvest bodies, and therefore the Nazi Party uh, promoted the idea of of the anti Jew. It stoked the fears and the races and, and the xenophobia and all, all that stuff. Right. To just so that they can get these bodies harvested. It, it, and they just chose. Well, to and, get the technology. That's what they really wanted. They wanted the trade, technology. It trade. Exactly. I, I understand. Yeah. So um, they were really sort of just stoking on prejudices that were pre existent and chose this group. Um, yeah. Or, or it was a revenge thing for, for Egypt. I'm not right, sure. right, but, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But still, I don't know the why Nazis they chose have, them. The Nazis would have to make that deal, so they would have. Hey, well, to, you see, it's not necessarily just the Nazis. It's not the, the you know Nazis, uh, the United States of America, Russia, China. It was never about that. It was never about you know the evil Nazis. No, no, no. It was always about the elite versus the people, and the elite who have been pitting the people against the people. And this is the whole reason why we had World War I and World War II. Mm-hmm. They funded Germany to act as a doorstop to stop the spread of communist Russia. That's why Germany bounced back 20 years after the elite funded the he- heck out of them mm-hmm. and then played both sides. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> they, they played both sides, you know. Uh, 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 the railroads were built by Westinghouse. Um, the oil was supplied by Standard Oil, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, Rothschild was, you know, he, he's also known as the Pinder, which means the pinnacle of the Draco, which means the penis of the dragon. He's the main representative of the Alpha Draconian here on Earth. He's behind the whole thing. He's, now, you know, the red shield, all that stuff. Why, why is it that they're so interested in the adrenochrome versus, I don't know, something like dimethyltryptamine, which is in the pineal gland? Um, well, I'm sure that they harvest everything they possibly can. Who mm. knows? Maybe they were going after that. I like to say, call it adrenochrome harvesting, because that's the great connect between the elite and the aliens. Adrenochrome. Right. They've been, they've been drinking the blood. It gets them high. Uh, you know, they've been carrying this practice with them for thousands of years. So, um, where did they get it from? Well, they got it from the aliens. That's, you know. Well, not, not to, maybe this isn't the best analogy, because we're not quite, sure. quite there yet. But, so, you have people who eat red meat from animals that are killed here. They enjoy it. And then, now we're at the point where we can create synthetic meat. People will probably say, well, it doesn't taste the same. Yeah, exactly. Is that what's happening here? Because it's yes. like you would be able to synthetically, if you're that you can. Yeah, Epinephrine. Right. Epinephrine exactly. is the exactly. synthetic. Yeah. You know, the EpiPen, the epinephrine. And that's there's a, something that's different a synthetic, about- but it's never the same. It's, it's a generic, you know? I mean, you take oxycodone, and then you take a generic of oxycodone. It's never the same thing. It's close, but it's not the same thing. But they're not just going for the adrenochrome, they're going for other stuff too. Enzymes, blood, organs, you know, they, uh, you know, from what I've heard, they actually rub themselves, they bathe in it. They bathe in it to absorb the nutrients into their skin because their digest- digestive tract is failing. Uh, the, the, the constant uh, cloning and rejuvenation of their bodies is starting for uh, to you know cause them their their species to deteriorate, and that's why um, you know yeah that's what I've heard. I've heard they actually put it on their skin, and their body absorbs it, and then they brush off the waste. That's how I heard they eat. I don't know. What I do know is is that we have the bodies, we have the evidence. That this is happening. What are they going after? They're not mutilating. It's not mutilations. They're not cattle mutilations. They're not human mutilations. They're harvesting. They're adrenochrome harvesting. And other things. I like to call it adrenochrome harvesting because it really 
puts the whole, you know, it, it, it's really what they're really going after, I believe. If indeed we actually did have a storm area 51 where you had thousands of people just decide to run, what, what do you think would have actually happened? Um, it, it wouldn't, I, I, it, it doesn't, that, it, that's, uh, not necessary considering the amount of evidence we have against them and, you know, the United States government. I mean, this is why they, uh, this is so, this is so complicated and so tricky. Um, um, let me finish off, <laughs> let me finish off with Travis Walton, okay? Sure. Like in, the, in the fire in the sky, the scene where they put, you know, rubber on him. It, it, they, they're dragging him through the spaceship. There's there's clothes and junk and stuff all over the place of humans. And then they put him on the the, the, the rock and then they put a, a plastic over him. They put something down his uh, esophagus, down into his stomach. And then a needle comes down and it goes right into the pineal gland. So what I believe they've, they've been doing uh, has been mixing up the person on the inside and their intestinal tract and because you can still be alive while while having that happen you know it's not affecting your vital organs but the intestinal tract whipping that up and then extracting the the pure adrenochrome uh, adrenaline before it goes into the bloodstream and that's why they showed us that that's why they changed the story um, but, uh, you know, also that, have you ever seen area 51 where these kids break into area 51, they go down into the basement and they, they find like uh, clothes all over the floor, same type of scenario, same type of deal, clothes all over the floor, um, you know, human beings, personal belongings, and then they come across a, a child's playroom. And then the next room, there's a table with blood all over it. And then the next room, there's um, these capsules for the aliens that to sleep in it. Well, I think that you know, I think that these movies have a lot of uh, reality to them. And um, yeah, you know, I think I, I honestly believe that that's what's been going on right underneath our feet this whole time. And this is why Space Force came about for many reasons. So one, the most important thing, the most important reason why Space Force happened was because we're missing $23 trillion and you can't, you know, that was going into the whole secret space program. Um, um, I'm not sure what it entailed, but I know it's for, for real. I mean, um, but, uh, um, um, oh man, where's it going with that? We've only, we've only got a a few more minutes and I, yeah, I'm trying to fit all my information, no, in, you know, right at the end. Um, it, it, it happens every show. So, yeah, one question that sure. comes from a, a steadfast friend, and that is, where are the alien bodies? Where are the alien bodies? Mm-hmm. Um, they are sitting in a um, university down in Peru. Okay, same. Okay, so... Wh- I know you don't have it on hand. Are you able to get me the name of the university so we can post that? Oh, uh, sure. Not, um, not right now. We can do it after okay. the show. Yeah, okay. But I, I definitely just want to check up on that, okay. um, give people a point of reference. Yeah, because it's not being talked about, and that's a big problem because it's like, um, and I think that's why Unidentified has come out and um, the other TV shows are starting to talk about it. Um you know it, it, how a- ancient aliens is really revving up their information that's really getting out well um so let me finish off here so admiral bird took the entire pacific fleet down to antarctica to flush out the remaining nazis when he got down there he was attacked by aliens and the nazis um and he was captured and told never to come back in 1952, the Nazis did a fly over the Capitol building, who I believe are the Nazis, uh, flew over the Capitol building in a show of force. In 1954, the Granada Treaty was signed by um, Eisenhower uh, with the Orion people from Orion trading human beings and cattle for quote-unquote medical experiments in trade for technology. The same deal the Nazis did. And that's why the a secret underground railroad in the heart of America is in the shape of Orion, just as the Nazi death camps, the death marches in Nazi Germany. 
So basically, they did the same thing. And why would they do the same thing? Because it was never about the Nazis versus anyone. It's never about the United States versus anyone. It was about the elite who have the money and control and connections to the Orion Group and the Alpha Draconians to keep this whole thing going. So it's scary, and it, I'm dead serious. And I know for sure that this whole thing has been uh, a nightmare for me, but it's all true. Um, did you see Tesla's drawings? Uh, the FBI released Tesla's drawing UFOs um, uh, in December of 2018. They finally released his records, and what did he? What was he doing? He was drawing UFOs. So well, he, he, he also claimed to be able to tap into he, yeah the, the ether and talk to just, these aliens, right? And all right, he so was talking to all these aliens, and everybody made him out to be crazy. Well, it's it was true. He was, and so they. Is, is show there, him their technology. Is the future of the human race safe? Are we? Are we? Oh. Um, yes, we are. We are. Um, we are going through some issues. <laughs> I mean, with my discovery of the Orion lines, which are the Nazca lines, I renamed them. I you know to the Orion lines. Mm-hmm. You'll see my work at theorionlines.com. Uh, but uh, on NASA's logo, I mean, it's a dead giveaway. They named everything Orion, right, for, for starters. But on their logo, it has Orion, Draco, and the Palladian star system. Well, Star Space Force just came out with their logo a few weeks ago. And it, it has Draco and Palladian. N- pl- uh, yeah, Palladian. No more Orion. Where did Orion go, ladies and gentlemen? Well... I have well, I have revealed the aliens with the solving the Nazca lines. So you think they're they're avoiding avoiding that now? Uh, I think so we, that they were in a very bad deal with them, and they finally got out of it. And now we're going to start getting the the whole technology thing's going to be starting to get released uh, to the public. Um, more information will start coming out, mm-hmm. uh, and we will be proceeding together as a group of human beings. All right, um, got together. Just one minute left here. Yes, Chin. So thank you so much for. for yeah, thank for, you. I, 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 I know. I know my work is like crazy, but I'm telling you, I'm. Well, like, I can't. I can't get behind the Holocaust thing. I just can't. That's fine. No, that's um, fine. But uh, some of your other ideas are are fascinating, and on this show, we we do give people a chance to to share their ideas. So I thank you for for yes. doing that. Um, and then for anyone who is listening, if you have any doubts, if you want to go to his website, if you want to fact check, go ahead. Um, Carol, Carl, and I were just looking at uh, Snopes dot com in regard to the the Nazca mummies that you're referring to. And, um, you know, they say it's fake. They say it's fake, but they didn't offer any, any actual counter evidence. Well, actually, no. I, I took all the bodies and I attacked NASA with them on their Twitter account. Mm-hmm. And two weeks later, they came out in December 4th, 2018, saying that tiny super intelligent alien beings are real. Well, I made them do that because I was attacking their Twitter account with all the evidence, with all the bodies. But they never included which aliens they were talking about, which tiny super intelligent alien beings. Well, the Nazca mummies. All right. Well, that's it. We're going to wrap it up, Rishan. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. And thank you, everyone, for listening tonight. If you have any questions or comments or feedback about tonight's show, you can email me at alan at net. And join us next Tuesday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, as usual, on KGRA Radio, your official contact for the best in alternative talk. Special thanks to KGRA producer Race Hobbs, and until next time, live in the mystery. Keep on coming, they point to the end, but I hold on so tight. Back and forth in the mind. Conclusions I don't wanna find